Thanks for, for having me here today. Um, so my name is Andrew Doxey and I'm a faculty member in, in biology and computer science at the University of Waterloo. Um, and so my lab uh, centers on the area of protein function prediction and also exploratory data mining of microbial genomes. Um, and I'm excited to give this talk today. This is a, a fresh talk uh, with brand new slides on a, a recent project uh, in our lab that is, is really looking at uh, building a functionally annotated tree of life um, based on a lot of the new metagenome-derived uh, genomes that are out there. Uh, and we're, we're really looking for a way of navigating through, through what is an enormous tree of life now uh, that, that's based on all this new data. Um, and so a lot of articles have come out uh, in the last couple of years that have looked at really uh, all uh, a large number of, of new genomes that are coming from uh, unculturable organisms. Uh, these are derived from metagenome projects. And these, uh, these studies have really transformed our understanding of the tree of life. So uh, they've, they've uh, led to new branches of the tree of life and uh, really a large number of new phyla. And that's shown quite nicely here in this study by Laura Hugg. Laura Hugg's a, a faculty member also in, in biology at, at uh, Waterloo. And you can see it from this tree, this came, uh, came out a couple years ago in Nature, Bio, uh, Nature Microbiology, that when you start bringing in metagenomes, you expand the tree of life to uh, really to new phyla. And, and so that, uh, that's shown nicely on the right here. We have what's called the candidate phyla radiation. This is a whole new branch, really, of the microbial tree of life um, that's, again, derived from metagenomes. So these are metagenome assembled genomes. Uh, these are not, necessar so not necessarily organisms that have been cultured and have been uh, examined before experimentally. Um, but the, the question that, that I really have with this kind of data is, is how can we explore it? How can we find new functionality uh, in, in, this, uh, uh, in, in these data sets? And they really are a gold mine uh, for new biology, potentially. They, there are novel gene families, uh, potentially new functions to be found. Uh, and so the question that, that my lab is focusing on is how can we functionally explore uh, the tree of life? And so what we are, are wanting to do, the way I'm going to frame this problem today, is you know, how can we start with a tree of life, uh, like that on the left, and how can we merge it with gene annotation data, protein function data, okay, so there we have uh, growing bioinformatics databases that really have a vast amount of, of annotation information from PFAM, from K, from GO. Uh, we also have these trees of life that are being built, but there are a few attempts that have actually tried to merge these two together, right? So how can we actually uh, do that? How do we integrate this, this data in a meaningful way? And there have been some attempts uh, to do that in the past. Um, so this is a, an image from uh, the PFAM resource. So you can pick any protein family you like, and you can visualize it uh, by mapping it onto a tree. Uh, and this is a pretty, pretty decent visualization. Um, here's another example. This is from the JGI uh, database. This particular uh, visualization is not working quite as well, but again, it's trying to annotate, trying to map functional information onto a tree. And then here we have a more recent um, resource called Aquarium that's also doing a fairly nice job. It's mapping it onto sort of an NCBI-based taxonomy um, where, you, where you can see the presence and absence of a gene family mapped onto a tree. But none of these are really uh, I think doing the trick, uh, there's more that can be done. But the problem is that there are some data visualization challenges when it comes to exploring the tree of life. Okay, so one problem is that with all this new information, with all these metagenome assembled genomes and all these strains that are out there now, uh, the tree of life has become too large to visualize easily. Uh, where do you start? How do you label the tree? Um, it's difficult to navigate. 
And another major problem is that the, the taxonomy, especially for bacteria, for, micro, uh, for prokaryotes in general, the taxonomy uh, is, is not very well defined. Um, and that's especially the case if you've worked with the NCBI before. NCBI taxonomy doesn't necessarily map onto what has been defined in the literature. And so computationally, um, you can think of maybe trying to divide this problem or partition it uh, into smaller, uh, smaller problems. And one of the ways of doing that is to actually uh, envision partitioning this tree, okay? So taking the tree of life and dividing it into different partitions. Those partitions can be thought of as different evolutionary time periods, where if you kind of go back in time, uh, maybe these, these branches here correspond to phylum level divergence, whereas these this region here maybe corresponds to class level divergence between species. And as we go further down the tree, we're getting lower down in taxonomy as well. So maybe this is now genus level divergence within the tree. And this, this has actually been accomplished quite recently by, uh, I think, a really uh, amazing study by Donovan Parks et al. This was just published uh, not that long ago in Nature Biotechnology. And, and what Parks uh, et al. did here was they built a, a really large uh, tree of, of microbial genomes, okay, based on about 120 uh, marker genes. And uh, using that genome-based tree, they then defined bacterial uh, and archaeal taxonomy in a way that's completely consistent with, with the tree. Okay, so they're kind of starting with, with NCBI and then trying to, to build a new phylogeny, a new uh, taxonomy that's based on genomes. And so you can see, this is a figure from their paper. They've actually done what I just described here uh, by partitioning the tree into these different zones. You can see uh, up here we've got phy the phylum level, uh, and then uh, as you go further down the tree, you get closer to the species level. Okay, this is the, the tree that's based on uh, so maximum likelihood analysis, again, of about 100 and 20 uh, marker genes, but you can also then correct or, or kind of normalize that tree for rate variation, and that's shown on the right here. So this is more of an ultrametric tree uh, where uh, we've, we've corrected it uh, based on, on the different rates. And one of the things that Parkstall then did was they looked at how NCBI taxonomy behaves using this genome-based tree. And this is a really interesting figure, I think, where what, what they are looking at is the relative evolutionary divergence between genomes, okay, when you start comparing them at these different uh, levels of taxonomy. And yes, you can see a general trend here uh, where there's, uh, there is lower evolutionary, uh, uh, or the evolutionary divergence uh, corresponds to, uh, to, to an increase in taxonomy. Okay, but there are definitely mistakes that are being made. For example, if we look at Clostridiales here, which is considered a family, if you look at, at uh, how other uh, data points are behaving in this plot, you might consider moving Clostridiales down and considering it in order based on the, the levels of divergence you see in these genomes. And so that is precisely what uh, Parkstall then did uh, in their database, which they call the Genome uh, Taxonomy Database here, is that they, uh, they then reassessed uh, bacterial taxa and moved them uh, to new locations in this, in this taxonomy structure based on the levels of, of divergence seen in their genomes. And so you actually can see a nice, nicely uh, behaving uh, uh, pattern here in, in the GTDB uh, compared to the NCBI. Okay, and, and so this uh, GTDB resource, this new bacterial taxonomy that just came out this year, uh, this really forms the basis of our work. So because there's now a bacterial taxonomy that is consistent with phylogeny, where there are genomes available for all the representative members, we got very excited and wanted to turn that into a phylogenomic framework that we could actually explore. And that is done uh, with this resource here that we've called Anotree. 
And the, the first thing I'll show you here is, is uh, this is the web interface here, where we've taken that exact genome taxonomy database, we've taken the tree, uh, and we've, we've uh, visualized it here. Um, and I'm showing this the tree at a phylum re resolution, okay? So uh, what we've done is we've, we've kind of zoomed out and we're only looking at the phyla, but because we have this consistent taxonomic system, it means that we can also change our resolution. We can look at the class level, we can look at the genus level, we can go all the way down to the genome level as well. And th this is just now the, the architecture of the tree or the topology. What we really wanted to do was add function to it. So the whole goal of this was to sort of paint the tree by, by gene function. And the way we did that was by uh, taking all of the genomes in this database, uh, predicting, again, uh, re-annotating the genomes by predicting all of the open reading frames, all, all of the genes, and then assigning those genes functions. So we looked at, at PFAM, we also looked at KEG, and we ended up with uh, over 100 million annotations. So that this is really a huge database uh, of information. Our next goal was then to, to really store all of that information. So again, we're taking the GTDB here, the taxonomy, the tree topology, the genome sequences, the proteins, and our functional annotations, and we're, we're merging them all together into a database, so a, a SQL database that we can then access with a, a front-end uh, uh, server. And that now is shown here. Uh, now what I'm showing you the same resource, but what we're doing is we're painting the tree by a function. And so all of these functions are pre-computed in the database. So all you have to do is pick any function, any pathway, any gene you like, and click go. And in a second, it's going to paint it onto the tree. It's going to tell you uh, who has it. Um, and you can further explore uh, different lineages that you're interested in. So up here, we have our query. You can, again, query it by KEG or PFAM. Uh, and we're increasing the number of annotations. Um, over here, we have a window showing, again, the presence and absence of these traits. And again, this can be looked at at any resolution you like, from the phylum all the way over to genomes. And then also another convenient um, uh, aspect of our, of our resource is that because we now have a taxonomic system that's been defined based on the tree, uh, we get a very accurate overview of the taxonomic distribution of a function. And that is something that uh, isn't uh, as easy to do using NCBI or other resources. And so this just shows you an example here. So uh, what we're doing is we're going to query the tree of life uh, with, a, with a gene. And that gene is going to be microbial collagenase. You hit go, it paints it onto the tree here. Uh, you get a summary here, which you can then look at in terms of phylum, class, genus, whatever you like. But then suppose you're interested in a lineage like Mixococcus here. You can then zoom in further uh, all the way down to the genomes, and you can look exactly at what genomes have the trait that you're interested in. That is uh, using a single query. But uh, one of the exciting things you can do is start to chain together, combine queries, and look for uh, essentially pathways. Um, and one example, uh, is, this is an example we, we talked about in the, in the paper, uh, is querying with these particular genes here. So when you look for these three genes, uh, you, you end up predicting a really small number of genomes, only 10 genomes in the database. They come from an organism here, a genus called Nitrospira. And it turns out that these three genes, when you find them together, uh, they, are, they encode a very, very interesting property uh, that has been identified in a couple of papers. This one here has identified these three genes in Nitrospira. Uh, they're found on different contigs. But the reason that they, this is so important, finding these three genes, is that when you find them together, it means the organism is capable of, of complete nitrification. So uh, th these organisms are unique by being able to catalyze all the steps in nitrification. And again, uh, AnnoTree uh, makes it very easy to find things like this. You just have to enter in that, that magic combination that you're looking for. 
Um, but next, I want to tell you more about global patterns of gene family evolution that we're finding through this resource. Um, and so what we next did was we mapped all of the, the gene families uh, in Keg and PFAM onto the tree of life, and we studied their patterns. We wanted to see what kind of, uh, of distributions do we see in different gene families and different functional categories and so on. And so we ended up mapping uh, over 28,000 gene families onto the tree, and then we analyzed them really for different evolutionary characteristics. We wanted to look at their lineage specificity, we wanted to look at their phylogenetic conservation, and one of the things that we're very interested in is, is the last one, that is patchiness. How patchy is a gene family on the tree? Uh, because this, this may be a nice way of identifying uh, horizontal gene transfer. So lineage specificity can be identified quite easily uh, what we do is we, we look for, uh, for two properties that we're calling catchment and saturation. Okay, and so this, this is really defined here where we can look at X percent of a gene family occurring in Y percent of the taxa that have that gene family under a, a phylogenetic node. Okay, so again, this is catchment and saturation. And so with these two parameters, we can kind of look for either extreme lineage specificity or not so extreme lineage specificity. And what we wanted to do is, is see, you know, what parameter values uh, we can use to identify these lineage specific families. And unfortunately, what we end up seeing when we explore parameter space here is uh, quite a, con a continuum and there's no obvious threshold. And so um, what, we, what we ended up then doing is being extremely stringent with our predictions and really only looking for those, those uh, gene families that, that show extreme levels of lineage specificity. And there aren't a whole lot in bacteria. Uh, there are uh, relatively fewer in a way than, than in, in eukaryotes because of the, the degree of, of gene transfer that's going on. So what we're looking um, at, uh, at these extreme cases, and what we notice is a trend like this, and this has been observed before in the literature, where at very high taxonomic levels, like, like phylum or class level, we see very few lineage-specific gene families, but as you move to, uh, to the species level, that increases. And so uh, this, I think, reflects the sort of ongoing uh, evolution in, in modern uh, uh, lineages. Um, one of the interesting statistical sort of anomalies that you probably notice is this here, that there seems to be an overrepresentation of these lineage-specific families at the class level. And so we looked into that a little bit further, and it turned out to be due to a whole uh, suite of gene families that are specific to cyanobacteria. And this, this reflects really the evolution of, of uh, photosynthesis in this particular lineage. However, we find a lot of other interesting lineage-specific gene families. Um, a lot of them are actually domains of unknown function. Uh, for example, this one here is, is highly specific to the enterobacteria. And uh, these on the left here and a whole uh, uh, suite of other, other guffs here are actually lineage-specific genes that are uh, essential. So previous studies have shown that deleting them uh, is, is lethal in bacteria. So there seems to be this correspondence between lineage specificity and essential uh, gene families. But these lineage specific families, uh, what we found is that they're, they're actually uh, quite a rare phenomenon. And the typical gene family in bacteria and, and uh, in microbes looks a little more like this. Um, and you can't really call this lineage specific uh, because well, it's, it's scattered, say, in this part of the tree, and, and it's highly conserved in this part of the tree, but this is still a non-random pattern, okay? It's, it's still mapping non-randomly onto the tree. And so the next question we wanted to ask is how many of these gene families exhibit a, a non-random pattern at all when, when mapped onto the tree of life? And uh, so we used a previous algorithm to, uh, to determine the statistical significance of that mapping, 
And we found that 68% that of KEG families and 60% of PFAM families mapped significantly or non-randomly onto the tree. Um, this is interesting because one, it tells us that, that keg terms are actually phylogenetically more, more congruent than PFAM, but it also tells us that about 30 to 40 percent of microbial gene families uh, seem to be ha having an almost random behavior on the tree, which is, is again, quite, uh, quite interesting, quite surprising. Um, but this probably has a lot to do with horizontal gene transfer. And so that's what I'm going to tell you about next. Uh, next, what we really wanted to do is, is zero in and find these cases of lateral transfer in a very large scale way. And so what we ended up doing is, is defining uh, what we call a patchiness score. And again, this, this has been done by previous literature. There are numerous metrics that will map traits onto a tree and try to measure the sort of inconsistency or incongruency with the tree. We implemented and tried a whole bunch of them. Uh, but it, it turns out that actually one of the simplest measures worked best, simple parsimony. Um, and so what we, we evaluated the parsimony of all these gene families, and we adjusted them actually for the family size, because there seemed to be a strong relationship depending on, on the, the, the size of, of these families. And just to show you how this works again, for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, parsimony works like this, where given a tree, you can map on uh, presence absence states onto the tree, uh, you can then infer the ancestral states uh, using using parsimony algorithm. Okay, um, that then allows you to count the number of state changes on the tree, and that gives you again an idea uh, of how congruent your presence absence states are with your tree. So we calculated this for all gene families, uh, and we obtained the following distribution here. Okay, where uh, we, we actually see a very few uh, gene families and microbes that are not, that are non-patchy, uh, and we see this large abundance of, of gene families with either moderate patchiness or extreme patchiness. And just to show you kind of what that looks like here, uh, here are some non-patchy distributions on the left, and here are some patchy distributions on the right. This extreme one on the right is actually transposase. Which, which makes a lot of sense uh, biologically. But this is interesting because these ones on the left, these may be your, your gene families evolving by vertical evo evolution, and these over here may be gene families evolving more by horizontal gene transfer. And so our next question is, what, what are the functional, uh, the, the functional attributes or categories that are associated with, with, with uh, these patchy gene families? Can we see some trends? And so what we did next was we evaluated this phylogenetic patchiness on the tree uh, for all gene families in KEG and PFAM, and we organized them uh, according to their, their function. And we actually, we see a result that I think makes a lot of sense, uh, where on the left here, these are your, our non-patchy gene families. Uh, the most extreme case is photosynthesis, which evolved, uh, uh, which is, is uh, specific to cyanobacteria. Uh, we, say, we see ribosomal uh, proteins. Um, and then on this extreme, the most extremely patchy gene families, those probably evolving uh, by extreme rates of horizontal transfer are our viral proteins. So, of course, bacteriophage, mobile elements, and over here, uh, prokaryotic defense system, so CRISPR. Okay? Uh, so this, this actually made a lot of sense um, and, and showed us that our metric for detecting uh, patchiness is, is working. Just to, to show you some more cases here, uh, zoomed in, uh, again, we've got photosynthesis on the left here, uh, and then we've got antibiotics and CRISPR and phage uh, that are really sticking out in terms of these distributions. Um, you may be wondering how robust these scores are. The way that we evaluated that was by removing a certain percentage of outliers, so the most distant taxa within a family. We would remove them, we would then recalculate these scores, and we found that actually the signals are, are quite robust. Uh, after removing uh, potential outliers. 
But what I, I want to focus on next are some, some cases, so some case studies that we've done over the last few years looking at some of these microbial gene families that seem to be quite patchy, uh, and I'm going to tell you some, some new things that we've learned uh, about them. And one, one of the gene family uh, or functions that we're most interested in is bacterial toxins, and, and toxins are, are uh, some of them anyway, are, not are notorious for undergoing lateral transfer. Um, and so we can use this resource to actually um, give, uh, give us some new insights into toxin evolution. And so what I'm showing you here now are uh, six, uh, six example toxins. Um, these are some are major toxins associated with human disease. Uh, and we've studied now a number of them using phylogenomics to see to really try to understand how it is that they have evolved, how they are are uh, are potentially spreading. Um, this one here is diphtheria toxin. Uh, this is the causative agents of diphtheria, and uh, this is one of the the most devastating uh, infectious diseases in in human history. And if you zoom in on, on the actinobacteria where this toxin is known to occur, uh, this is the pattern you see. Now, what is known is the one lineage uh, that contains the toxin. So this is Carinibacterium diphtheria. Uh, this, again, is known. Um, and yet, uh, when you look at Anotree here, you're actually seeing uh, perhaps some, some related toxins in neighboring lineages within the actinobacteria. Okay, now this is not the entire tree, but this is the neighbors of, of Carinibacterium, which makes it particularly interesting to find homologs of this toxin. Uh, and these ones are completely unknown, so no one has actually ever studied these particular toxins here, uh, again, making them, making them very interesting. So we've done phylogenetic analysis of these genes, and this is a collaboration with Roman Melnick at, uh, at SickKids. Um, and uh, what you see is a very interesting pattern here where diphtheria toxin is forming this clade, uh, and these new diphtheria-like toxins that we found are, are outgrouping or forming sister lineages um, uh, to, to DT itself. This one here, which seems to be a, the closest relative of, of diphtheria toxin, occurs in an organism that is actually a known pathogen of lizards. Okay, so it's not doesn't seem to be a human pathogen, but it's, it uh, is a pathogen of a different host. And what's very interesting when we, when we do structural bioinformatics of these predicted toxins, we see uh, the following pattern where uh, the catalytic domain and the translocation domain, which are really sort of the main mode of action for this toxin once it gets into the, into the cell, those are highly conserved in these new toxins, but the receptor binding domain, which we think is providing the host specificity, is extremely divergent in these other toxins. So we potentially have a shift from an ancestral diphtheria-like toxin targeting different hosts to that targeting humans. Um, one of the other toxins that we've, we've looked at is this one here. This is actually the most deadly toxin known to science. Uh, this is the clostridial neurotoxin responsible for tetanus and, and botulism. And when you look at its distribution in Anotree, uh, you see the following uh, pattern here. And you can look, you can see just from the tree that there, there's an overrepresentation of this toxin in this particular lineage here, and this is the Clostridium lineage, and this is what's known. So botulinum toxin is known to occur in Clostridium, but what, again, is very surprising, very interesting, is that there are homologs of this toxin in neighboring lineages within the tree, again, making them interesting. Okay, so we've, uh, we've studied these quite a bit over the last few years. Uh, the way I'm just gonna depict them is not through a tree, but more through a, an ordination-like plot. Uh, I think it's a neat way to visualize uh, sequence relationships. So here we have botulinum toxin from Clostridium forming a family, uh, but the new toxins that we're finding are sitting on the periphery of this family. So they're actually evolutionary neighbors uh, that are quite divergent, but again are related to the botulinum toxin. So it's quite possible that botulinum toxin is a member of a much larger family that you can, again, see by looking at these neighboring lineages. 
One of these toxins uh, is actually uh, quite, quite interesting, but also concerning. And we found this toxin earlier this year in an organism called Enterococcus faecium, which is associated with vancomycin resistance and is actually a major uh, human pathogen. Uh, this particular strain uh, came from cow feces on a farm in North Carolina. Uh, it was sequenced, it was deposited in the database, and our, our toxin uh, detection algorithms found it uh, shortly after. And it's sitting in a gene cluster like this, okay? So uh, we call this toxin BONT, E-N, for Enterococcus. Uh, and when you compare it to gene clusters from, other, from Clostridium, uh, you see the following pattern here. So you see conserved syntony, you see a lot of the same genes, uh, but what's surprising is that there's only 30% or less than 30% identity at the protein level. So uh, again, th this may not be something that sticks out at you when you're doing a BLAST result, but when you do a phylogenomic analysis and you see this, this gene occurring in a related clade, uh, it, it, may, it may draw your attention to it. Um, this particular toxin uh, seems to have emerged in a particular lineage of Enterococcus faecium. That's this one right here, which is clustering uh, actually next to, to, to another one um, that is a, a pathogen. And it's, it appears to have gained the gene. And we've, we've actually sequenced it, and we've resequenced it, uh, and found that it's sitting on a mobile plasmid. Um, it's also been tested experimentally. I'm not going to go into the work uh, here. Uh, and it is shown to, to have um, uh, neurotoxin function. It cleaves the same proteins. It even causes uh, paralysis in the, in the right conditions. So uh, potentially concerned. Uh, but this brings up sort of another technique that we're, we're exploring more now. And that is, can we mine anotree? Can we find these gain events? And uh, we've done parsimony, we've got this, this kind of patchiness score, but if we, we want to be more precise than that. We want to be able to say, here is a potential gain uh, of, a, of a gene family in this part of the tree of life. And one of the ways that we can do that is, is to use a different computational technique. Um, we can use, again, we can map our presence absence states onto the tree. And uh, this time we can estimate conditional probabilities of the ancestral nodes. We can do maximum likelihood reconstruction and get more of a, of a continuous probabilistic ex, uh, estimation of whether or not an ancestor possessed that trait. So this is a, gives us a, a nicer way of statistically saying, okay, I think this is a gain event or this is a loss event in the tree. And so, for example, if we're wanting to find gains, we can look for state changes that are likely, for example, absence to presence in the tree. Um, we have applied this on a, on a very large scale now uh, across the tree of life, uh, and we've mapped all of the gains that we found using maximum likelihood uh, in different lineages. And one of the interesting things that we're finding is that a lot of these gains are happening relatively recent in evolution. These are not ancient gains, but rather recent gains that are happening within a strain or within a species. And what we can do is we can further mine the data. We can look for interesting cases that, that, uh, that might hint at new biology. For example, eukaryote to, bacteria tree, uh, to bacterial gene transfers. So we can look at gains in bacteria that may be coming from eukaryotes, for example. And it may be hard for you to see, but there's, uh, this is one gene family here called Ephrin, uh, and this Ephrin protein, it's found nowhere in the microbial tree of life except this one lineage of proteobacteria right here, and also uh, a large subset of eukaryotes. So the most likely phenomenon or, or scenario uh, that has resulted in this is a gene transfer from eukaryotes to uh, this proteobacterial lineage. Um, this turns out to be an interesting uh, example biologically because this li the lineage is called endozygomonas, uh, and this is actually a host-associated bacterium. It, it, uh, uh, it lives within corals. And in fact, there's not just one of these eukaryotic genes that's been transferred, but we've detected about a dozen of them. 
So there's been, there's been a whole suite of eukaryotic genes that's transferred into this organism, uh, probably making, uh, making it ad uh, adapted for a host-associated lifestyle. Now for the last uh, application of this work, um, so I, I've talked to you so far how, about how we can explore the tree of life, we can look at patchiness, we can look at evolution of gene families. Um, I now want to move on to how we can use this data to do protein function prediction in a way. And this technique, this is not a new technique, it's been done uh, before many times. Um, but what we have now by having a very large and comprehensive tree of life, I think we have a, a, a very uh, nice data set for doing this kind of work, this co-occurrence um, analysis of genes. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this, the way it works is we have a gene presence absence matrix. Okay, So we've got our genes up at the top here, we've got our genomes along the side, and what we're trying to do really is find genes that have correlated profiles. They have profiles that are very similar to one another. And when we find that, it often suggests that there's some functional interaction between those two genes. So let's consider uh, one, one example here. So imagine we have one gene family that is behaving this way, and again, black is present, uh, white is absent. And now, suppose there's another gene family uh, that has a very similar, in this case, identical pattern to it. Well, this may look correlated. But the problem is, when we bring in the, the phylogenetic tree, then what we actually see is that this isn't uh, many independent patterns, but rather that there are, are only really two patterns here. Because this uh, entire clade uh, uh, contains a present state, this entire clade here contains an absent state. Okay, so when you do correlations, you assume that your data points are independent from, another, from one another, but the problem is we are showing that this is not the case. The tree is, is showing you that all these data points are dependent on, on one another, and in, in a sense there's redundancy in the data. Okay, um, now consider uh, a pattern more like this, okay, more of a patchy trait. Now, if we look at this pattern and we find another one like it, um, in this case, we can, we can be more confident that this correlation is meaningful. Why can we be more confident? Well, because each of these cases, each of these gain states are independent of one another. And we can use the tree to tell us uh, that these states are independent and they're not clustering together, okay? So I think the great value of, of having a tree here is, is to help us remove the redundancy and recalculate these correlations between gene families. And there are a number of approaches that have done this. One of them is called phylogenetic regression. Um, and I'm not going to go into, into the details, but rather I'm going to tell you about one case here where we've applied this, and I think it's worked uh, very nicely. Um, so last year, uh, well actually a couple of years ago, uh, we discovered a new protease family in, in bacteria. Um, this Protease family uh, it was a, essentially a domain of unknown function, and no one had studied it. No one uh, knew what it was doing, and it, it, it was it is quite widely distributed on the tree. It has this uh, presence absence profile in in anno tree, and it is relatively patchy as well. So this makes it again a really nice case for doing this kind of uh, phylogenetic uh, co-occurrence analysis, and. So I'm just going to jump straight to the result here. So what we, we, we've done is we've ranked all, uh, all uh, keg gene families based on their phylogenomic correlation to this. So essentially we're looking for other genes that show a very similar kind of phylogenomic profile. And the result that we get is, is this here. So the top correlating gene uh, is this, is this uh, chemotaxis protein here. Uh, you get some uncharacterized proteins here, and as you can see, uh, you get a whole bunch of flagellar gene families. So you can probably guess what might be going on here. Uh, just to show you that this approach is working, let me focus in on, on the top prediction, and, I, and you can compare the phylogenomic uh, pattern of co-occurrence here. Again, this novel protease family that we found 
uh, is shown on the left here. This uh, chemotaxis protein is shown on the right. And in fact, the novel protease family almost looks like a subset of the pattern on the right. In other words, uh, this gene family is moving around in bacteria preferentially to those bacteria that already have this chemotaxis function. That's the way we're interpreting this. Um, what does this protein do? Well, uh, chemotaxis proteins like this one are involved in the transmission of sensory signals from chemoreceptors to the flagellar motors. So it's somehow involved in, again, uh, motility chemotaxis uh, and, or regulation of chemotaxis. Um, and again, here we have all of the flagellar uh, genes that I'm showing you in blue. So again, based on this, you would predict that this, this novel protease is somehow involved in, in, the back, in motility, in chemotaxis, maybe it's part of, of bacterial flagella. Um, and so to, to make a very long story short, this took many years of work, but I'm going to jump straight to the result here. Um, what we uh, ended up doing is we picked an organism that has this protease and we, we purified its flagellar filaments. Uh, we, then, we raised an antibody to this protease and here I'm showing you the immunoelectron uh, micrograph uh, of, um, of that protease. You can see the flagellar filaments here, okay, so these are the bacterial flagella from this uh, organism called Clostridium hemolyticum and the dots here uh, are showing you where uh, the protease is localized. So uh, the, this protease, is, it turns out, is actually a novel component of bacterial flagella. Um, and, uh, and again, it's, it's quite interesting that you can predict that just based on phylogenomic patterns. Okay, um, so just in summary here, we've developed this new resource called AnnoTree uh, for phylogenomic analysis of the microbial tree of life. And this is really a new framework for exploring the evolution of, of microbial gene families and traits. Um, for example, looking at the origins and spreads of, uh, of toxins and virulence factors and antibiotic resistance genes. Um, but it, it also is potentially useful in predicting gene function as well. And for future work, what we want to do is really add to this uh, resource. We want to improve the pangenome analysis um, uh, for highly sequenced organisms. We want to expand it more to eukaryotes as well, uh, include additional types of annotations like Go uh, and, and other pathways, start to look at things like relative abundance to look at, at gene duplications, um, and then better incorporate this likelihood reconstruction to, to do really sensitive mapping of, of gains and losses on the tree. And so I'd like to acknowledge really the main uh, team that, that was involved in developing AnnoTree. Uh, my grad student uh, on, the, on the left here, Karen Mendler, also Han Chen, who's a, a really a fantastic uh, CS undergrad, uh, and also my collaborator, uh, Donovan Parks, uh, and, and also my colleague, uh, Dr. Laura Hugg uh, at the University of Waterloo. And also my, my lab here, um, and my, my uh, various funding sources. And lastly, uh, so this is, like I said, fresh uh, new data. Um, so we, we've just deposited this manuscript in, in BioArchives, so check it out. Uh, also, uh, please check out AnnoTree uh, 